Our findings show that the systems have been broken, they still are broken, and they're rooted deeply in colonial uh, constructs. If we look at, uh, take for example, the child protection system, what we've found is that Aboriginal children are 21 times more likely to be in the out-of-home care system. It's just not working. We found in the criminal justice system, over the last decade, the rates for Aboriginal people being on remand has gone up 560%. That shows you that these systems do not work for Aboriginal people. They have never worked for Aboriginal people and there needs to be transformational change for our community. And you've characterised this as gross human rights violations. Why? Well, people are being locked up for long periods of time, for children being removed without uh, adequate resources for families, we're about keeping kids and families connected, particularly when you talk about cultural rights, they're being denied. Uh, we've heard of children being in youth detention being locked up for uh, long periods of times in their cells. Where are the human rights in that? And we're talking about the over-representation of First Peoples in this state, that their human rights and cultural rights in both systems are not being upheld. You've made 46 recommendations some of them are sweeping and quite profound. For instance, you want the state government to decriminalise offences linked with disadvantage, and that could arise from poverty, homelessness, mental illness, any form of social exclusion. That could apply to a large number of laws, couldn't it? What, what sort of laws are you talking about? Any laws that need to be changed. I mean, this is the first truth-telling commission in Australia, in Victoria, for Victorian First Peoples. We are not going to tinker around the edges here. We're talking about real change. We've had over 200 years of a colonial system that needs to change. It is the same, it just looks different in today's contemporary society. We will, we're not going to stop until we have self-determination for First Peoples in this state. And I'll get to self-determination in a second, if I may, but going back to those laws, um, you could argue that so many, maybe most of the offences that we have in our books are actually tied to or arise from social exclusion. Can you give us some examples of what you're talking about that, would, that you'd see that we'd have to change? So we're looking at changing um, uh, the bail laws, for instance. They knew that when they made those changes to the bail laws, they would uh, adversely affect First Peoples and since those laws were changed up, the rate of Aboriginal people has gone up, and for women in particular has gone up. That, that excludes women from parenting. You lose your home, you lose your job. Uh, and so all those uh, laws that encompass around what it is for your social determinants of health are taken from you. Um, and so we've heard numerous stories about people being incarcerated and coming out with nothing and being homeless. So those laws need to change. We uh, have heard about the child protection system that has these permanency laws um, that once you've been in care for two years, um, you can go to permanent care. They need to be changed. If we change these laws for the most vulnerable in Victoria, we change them for First Peoples, we change them for everybody and we change them for the most vulnerable uh, within our society. Commissioner, in the hearings, you were particularly impassioned by the issue of what's called pre-birth reports mm. for pregnant Indigenous women. And I would guess that a lot of non-Indigenous people don't even know what that is. Can you explain what it is and the deep problems concerning you? So anyone in the public can obviously make a notification about children or pregnant women. And so what happens is the child protection system has a notification system. They can't do anything until the child's born, but they can uh, certainly offer support to a mother. But we know of the history of Aboriginal women, so uh, that's not a likely uptake. Um, and so there can be notifications, which is saying there's something wrong in this family, you need to investigate. They cannot investigate until the child's born. So uh, let me give you a, a clear example. A healthcare worker told us around a mother where a notification was made when she was early on in her pregnancy um, with the situation that was happening then. 
Now, I want you to imagine a mother giving birth, waiting to meet her child. Her child's born, and the first person she sees here, excuse me, is a child protection worker. As a mother, how do you grapple with that? And then you think you're going to have uh, this beautiful baby to take home. It may not, it may be the case. In that case, that situation had changed for that mother, but they didn't offer to find that out. They were the first person that mother saw. If that does not affect you as a human being and you think that's okay, there's something grossly wrong with that. And Aboriginal mothers are double the rate. We need, these things need to change. This is not okay. This adds to the intergenerational trauma for First Peoples in this state. If we don't make transformational change and have self-determination in both these systems, these are the violations that happen to our people. Your emotions are obviously pretty clear with this and you've had to listen to, all the commissioners have had to listen to so much evidence on this. Are you, do you still carry that pain with you? I think when it comes to our people, um, we've never had this. For me, it humanises it and you then have a face to these. I've worked in the child protection system for a very long time. I felt like I was a bit sort of numb to it and I was able to clinically do the work. But when you have generations after generations of people telling you the same story or they're telling you their story as a child being removed because it's, it's so long ago, it's the same story as stolen generations. We need change and we need this to happen urgently. The Commission wants to raise the age of criminal responsibility to 14, but as well as that, to not have any detention for any child under 16. What would that look like? We can't actually say what that would look like, but what we can say is that we would be looking to other states and territories and overseas uh, to what best practice is. If you think about it, it's a child that's a child that's 14 or 15. Now we know that locking children up does not work. We're very clear and it sets the pipeline for adult prison. So what we need to do is we need to care and nurture for these people and it, it possibly could be a health response. Children innately aren't criminal. Something has happened to them that has caused this and our response should be one that supports and nurtures these children. You also want an independent oversight body for police. How confident are you that that's going to happen? Let's be real, that's a no-brainer, right? The, that police investigating police does not work and it doesn't particularly work for First Peoples who don't put in complaints because of that, that reason. Uh, on the stand, the, the, the Commissioner for Police said he was open to oversight, to any type of oversight and uh, we take that as a positive and, and we've put that in as a recommendation. So you'd be urging the police to look pretty quickly oh, at this? We urge government to, to work with the police on exactly what that can look like and that change needs to happen. We talked about how long these hearings have been, how much evidence you've heard and so much painful evidence as well. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a story that stayed with you? I think that one about the unborn notification is, is that, that, will, that will not leave me. There's quite a few uh, and, and particularly around uh, police brutality have really um, stayed with me, particularly an uncle who gave evidence and talked about, uh, you know, being watched, being followed and he, in his words, being bashed by police in a cell. The one thing that really, for me, as a, as a First Peoples of this state, which he, he was, saying that he only felt safe when he went overseas, shows that Aboriginal people feel like they're under surveillance. With, with, and that was a common thread through a lot of what we heard in the evidence of uh, criminal justice. Back to what you were talking about before, which is really the crux of all this, wanting self-determination. We're in a situation, obviously, at the moment where um, there's a lot of division over a voice, an, an advisory body in the Constitution, um, and self-determination seems to go a lot further than that. Mm. How confident are you that there's the political will to hand over power, as you put it in, in, in your words, hand over power to First Nations people to start changing these laws? 
firstly on that, there's the, in the 46 recommendations, there's two types. So there's the change that needs to happen now for the harms that are happening to our people. And then that's that long transformational change, which um, um, you're talking about around self-determination in both systems. Um, we've had goodwill from the Victorian government. They've set up this, the First People's Assembly to negotiate a treaty. And out of that also, we've had the truth-telling process. We think there's goodwill in the government and we urge them to take up both the urgent and the long-term reform. Uh, and we, you know, uh, Daniel Andrews has come out and said they need an overhaul of the child protection system within the first week of our hearings. So we see there's goodwill there and this is how we're going to get transformational change and self-determination for us as First Peoples. There is goodwill there, but what I will say is we need change. Goodwill is all all great for everybody to hear, but unless we see true change, we're still gonna have our people being removed at the highest rates in the country. And he said, this is shameful, it's very shameful. We've seen since the bringing the, um, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal uh, deaths, 34 more deaths in this state. It has to stop, they have to take up these recommendations and we need to get self-determination for our people. Otherwise, there's no other way this is gonna happen that our people are gonna get out of this cycle, this colonial cycle that keeps pushing us to the bottom. As you say, self-determination is part of a longer term project, as is the treaty. Mm -hmm. What would you have to say about the many, many bureaucrats that you saw in these hearings who were talking about treaty as the place for some of these reforms? Yeah, that, that's again, those, those recommendations are broken up into two. We need urgent action on harms that are happening now and we've made those uh, clear in our, in our report. The long-term goal is treaty with self-determination and look, we heard over, I think roughly around seven apologies. We need action, so you can apologise all you like but unless that comes with action, uh, not much is gonna happen. There is goodwill there and we are relying on that um, with the evidence. This hasn't been done before. This is a landmark report. No one else has a treaty, pro a truth-telling process that's been able to gain this evidence that we have to say what First Peoples need and what First Peoples want in both these systems. How proud of that report are you? Extremely, extremely proud. As a First Peoples of Victoria, I never thought we would be able to uh, have a First Peoples Assembly, let alone a, a Truth Telling Commission. We don't do this alone. Those voices of our people that are, are now fighting for justice and the people of the past, our ancestors and all of those people, their voices are in these reports. It's just such an honour to be able to do this on behalf of, of First Peoples of the state. And how significant is it within the country at the moment Oh, extremely, extremely significant. No one else has this. I'm really proud of this state and the way we've moved forward. Uh, we, uh, we're just blown away by the generosity of First Peoples coming forward to tell their stories. And we're, we're leading the way. And I know that our, our people, First Peoples, are really proud of this state at this point in time. And you've still got more work to do? Lots more work to do, yeah. Commissioner, thank you. Thank you.